A reminder, parents, to pick up your children after service. You need to go over there to get them. You need to smile. That wasn't a smile, Carson. There we go. Okay. You ever wonder what people are thinking sometimes? You know, when you see some of the current fashion trends, you're like, what, what are you thinking? Um, there's times when I'm reading scripture that I'm like, what were they thinking? Um, what w- did Noah's wife say when Noah came home and said, hey, honey, I'm building a big Did she, did I just cut out? <laughs> Um, what, what do you think Daniel thought when he got first let down and he saw all those hungry lions? What was he thinking? What, was the, um, what were the last words uttered by Lot's wife? Chuck Swindoll said, we don't know what Lot's wife said, but, we do, but she did not believe in what she'd been told. And we know what happened to Mrs. Lot when she took that last look, what it says in Genesis 19. But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, meaning her husband Lot, and she turned to a pillar of salt. Swindoll said, the bottom line of Mrs. Lot's philosophy could be etched in her salt block gravestone. There's no need to take God seriously. He went on to write, I know of no philosophy no uh, more popular than that today. How many people today really do not take God seriously? And it's that thinking that, and that doing that gets people into trouble in their life and more so in trouble with God. We need to take God seriously. We need to trust that when he says something in the scripture, it's real. It's authoritative. We should take it very seriously. There are many people, even Christians today, who refuse to listen to the word because it just doesn't sit well with their lifestyle or it, it does, they don't like the way it is or I just don't want to obey. And when it comes to sin, we need to take it seriously because it is our sin that separates us from God on an ongoing basis for some of us. And if we keep that, it'll separate us eternally from God. Too many people suffer for it because of the pleasures of this world. They'll suffer for it in the next world. They don't want to repent and seek the Lord. Last week, we looked at two different people in Scripture. We looked at Adam, and then we looked at Jesus. We saw how Paul Paul compared. I'm just going to tell you right now, real quick. My mouth hasn't been working real well the last few days. Um, I I said some weird ways, weird words in Sunday school today, and the kids were laughing, um, and I deserve it. Okay, so if I do it, it's okay to chuckle, because, you know, I I would laugh at you, too. Okay. All right, so last week, we looked to Adam and Jesus, and we saw how Paul compared and contrasted the two of them. And because of what we read so far in Romans, because of the wrath of God, sinners and the people who, did it just cut out again? My battery might be dying. Um, Because of the wrath of God towards sin, because God makes us righteous, not because of our own acts, but because of him, because he pours out upon us justice, uh, justifying us in faith. Paul then comes to this chapter and he asks us a question. And common sense is something that we usually we usually need to follow. Hey, how are you? Do you want to know something? Everybody is looking at you. <laughs> How do you get these out, Jason? So I am just as good as Tim Tebow. All right, so good. Yeah, it's a common thing. All right, so let's get... Sometimes common sense, we like to follow common sense. And there are a lot of people today who don't seem to follow common sense, right? I mean, you can see it again in their attire or things like that. Or Lot looking back. Or Lot's wife looking back. That wasn't common sense. So sometimes common sense 
becomes nonsense. And that's what Paul is going to look at today. Paul asks a question, shall we go on sinning now that we are in Christ? And here's the basis of it. Because of my sin, I've come to know Christ. Because of my sin, I have learned about the grace of God. Because of sin, I can know Jesus. So common sense says, keep on sinning so I can know God more and more. And while you guys, I just saw some of you like, <laughs> it may not be the battery. <laughs> it's the cord. And while some people think that's ridiculous, there are a lot of people throughout the ages, starting back when Paul wrote this to today, who think that very same thing. Well, hey, if sinning got me to know Jesus, I'll keep doing it so I can continue to know him. Should we keep on sinning so we can continually receive grace? We're in chapter 6 of Romans, and let's go ahead and turn there. Paul starts off, well then, and, and that well then could actually be translated, therefore. It's, it's a really the same word phrase, so therefore, which means we need to see what is there for. And that was all the way for chapters 1 through 6, bring us to this point. Because of all that, because of all the justice, because of all the righteousness, because of God's wrath, should we keep on sinning? Should we keep on sinning so God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Really, that should be, duh. <laughs> Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ in baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive. Do you get that? Alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desire. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now, now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. You live under the freedom of God's grace. Since this new year, Casey and I have been trying to live healthier. Okay? We started exercising and eating better. I have actually eaten tomatoes, which is a big step for me. Okay? This is a big step for me. Um, but there are certain foods I miss. I, macaroni and cheese. And, and I know some of you like the, the, you know, the homemade stuff. I'm talking the cheap, chemically yellowed. <laughs> I just miss some of these foods and, and I'm constantly looking for foods that, that we can say, hey, yes, this is healthy. We can, I have found the perfect diet. Have you ever heard people say, I found the perfect diet. This is what you need to do. You don't eat this. or you don't. Here's the diet, okay? I found it. This diet allows me to eat anything I want, as much as I want, whenever I want. And you're all waiting for the punchline, aren't you? You're like, okay. One catch. For every calorie I eat, I have to eat, run one mile. 
so I'm not doing that. <laughs> no. It's not really worth it, is it? And yet that same diet of food is sort of like sin. Eat all you want, do all you want, do anything you want, but there's a catch to it. You can't outrun it. It's not that you can do so much to relieve yourself of the sin. It's, it's not that you can work off some of your bad behavior. You can't outrun sin or outdistance yourself. There's only one escape. And that is through Jesus. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. What you and I result, need, we deserve because of our sin is death. But the free gift, not the earned gift, of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our only, hate, our only hope to escape sin is found in Jesus. But I have this dilemma. Since trusting Christ as my Savior, surrendering to Him in faith and obedience, I've discovered that I still sin. How many of you struggle with that? Did you notice that after you've given your... I had one person, the rest of you all lied. <laughs> we, we give our lives to Christ. We start trusting Him and we're growing more in faith and then we sin. C.S. Lewis said, If conversion to Christianity makes no improvements in a man's outward actions, if he continues to be, to be just as snobbish or spiteful or envious or ambitious as he was before, then I think we must suspect that his conversion was largely imaginary. Now, is C.S. Lewis saying that you need to be perfect when you be a Christian? No. But he's saying that once you become a Christian... You don't stay as you were the day before. You start growing more. A missionary in Germany read that quote from C.S. Lewis, and he wrote back, Kill the old man. And he's right. Kill the old sinful nature. Kill that old style. It's like the old story about an African convert to Christianity. He was given a position of trust by the missionary, but he violated that trust and stole something. The missionary said, why did you take something that didn't belong to you? And this guy replied, it wasn't I who stole it. It was the grandfather in my bones. Now, he's not talking about old people. The way that he was saying it is, that's the old sinful nature that has been in me for a long time and it has grown so deep into my bones. That's the way of saying his sinful nature grew. In time, however, that native did grow stronger in his faith when asked by that missionary, how is the grandfather in your bones? He said, the grandfather isn't dead, but he doesn't get around like he used to. And shouldn't that be of our sinful nature? Shouldn't that be that, you know, it doesn't poke its ugly head out as much as it used to. That I am not perfect, but I keep getting a little closer to the one who is. I am not better, but his grace is living in me even stronger that I do forsake more and more. And I'll tell you this, Paul, one of the great top-notch, I mean, if we were going to elevate Christians based on their faith and their obedience, we put Paul at the top looked at himself, I am the worst. Because the closer we get to Christ, the lower we fall down. The lower we fall down on our knees because we know how holy and how awesome he is. And we don't want to go back to that old sinful life. And that's what Paul is trying to say here. As we yield to Christ, walk with him on a daily basis, that grandfather in our bones, that sinful nature will get weaker and weaker because the Holy Spirit is growing stronger. With that, look again at verses 1 through 4. Well then, should we keep God can show us more of this wonderful grace? Of course not. Hey, Austin, why don't you turn this... Is it on? Well then, should we go on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Once you have died in it, do you want to continue holding on to death and decay? 
Have you forgotten that when you joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we are joined with him in his death? For we died, we were buried with Christ by baptism. Just as Christ was raised, remember, he's not in the tomb. Raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we too can live a new life. We put to death the old life. We bury it. And I really, this is going to be gross. How many of you have seen those road kills on the side of the road? Yeah, some of you caused them. I've seen some of you like, hey, there's something. I, I know. And you don't want to roll your window down when you go by those, especially after they've been there for a while. That's where our sin nature is. And we bury it. It is a dead corpse. And if we continue to go back to that style of living, it is basically grabbing that old corpse and carrying it around. That's how we smell to God. Because we're continually going there. But we buried that. You cover it up. You leave it there. And you move on in a new life. Whether you realize it or not, when you give your life to Christ, when you are buried in baptism, you surrendered to Christ. When you said yes to Jesus, you were saying you were willing to obey him in repentance and in baptism. We need to remember those vows that we made. That we died to sin. We died to ourselves, and we need to live like he lived. We need to start being what the Bible says. We are not perfect Christians here. But we better be Christians who are getting better. Because if not, we're a social club. And social clubs fade and die. The church endures. Billy Sunday, the, Bible, uh, the baseball evangelist and reformer, I think he had a great idea. I love this quote. He had the right idea and formula. He preached Christ as the only answer to man's needs until he died in 30, uh, 1935. Here's what he said. I'm against sin. I'll kick it as long as I got a foot. I'll fight it as long as I got a fist. I'll butt it as long as I've got a head. And I'll bite it as long as I've got a tooth. When I'm old, fistless, footless, and toothless, I'll gum it till I go to glory. <laughs> That's how we need to fight against sin nature. Then no matter what's happening, no matter how weak my body gets, I will not stop fighting against it because he overcame it and greater is he that is in me. Do we live it? Do we believe it? That's the right idea. Sin will raise its ugly head from time and time again. We must go to the Lord and seek his mercy, his grace and power. Because should we keep on sinning now that we've come to Christ? No, because we died. We died to sin. There was a farmer who really struggled with this. And so he literally, and I told this story before, he literally went and dug a grave and he prayed and he said, God, I'm pouring out my sins. I've been baptized, but I keep struggling with this. So he, he stood by this empty grave and then he, he poured out his heart and he prayed and then he covered it. He made a little wooden tombstone. And then any time he was struggling, he'd come back to that same grave and he says, you're dead. You're buried. I am alive with him. Get back in the grave, Satan. Because I am alive in Christ. He had to physically see that. We died to Christ. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on to tell why we should not continue. Verse 8. And since we died with Christ, we know we'll also live with him. We are sure of this. That part where it says we are sure, it is a confidence. It is not something. How many of you can go like this and you're sure? Hey, it smells good. We know those commercials. There's a confidence in this. This is even more. We are confident of this because Christ was raised from the dead. He will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. How many of us can say that? We know death is still here. We're still feeling the effects or it's even growing, encroaching. We know it. But Christ beat it. When he, Jesus, died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and, what's the word? Alive to God through Jesus Christ. Jim Blake, Scott Saltzman, 
Sherm Nichols. Any of you know those names? Awesome. You know Scott Saltz. You know You don't know Jim Blake. You know two of them. Yeah, Jim Blake's never been out here. These are gospel preachers who had an impact on my life. Jim Blake is my uncle. And when I was young, after my uh, mom was divorced, he became this father figure. And, and I had three heroes in my life. I had the Incredible Hulk, <laughs> Spider-Man, and Uncle Jim. And I saw as a minister in his life how he loved the church. I saw him pouring out his heart and crying during the message because he wanted people to hear it. I saw it lived in his life. Scott Saltzman is a minister in Fremont. He has been one of my mentors. He's discipled and held me accountable to the calling of Christ in my life. In fact, he's the one that performed the marriage for Casey and I. He did our premarital and he asked Casey, are you sure about this one? He really did say that. I'm not joking. Uh, through Scott, I've been able to see and hear the voice of God speaking to me and moving me. Sherm Nichols was this old, out of date minister. He was culturally ir irrever irrever irreverent. No. Irrelevant. There's the word. <laughs> Not irreverent, irrelevant. And, and Sherm Nichols came in. His style of clothing was really bad for the time. Um, he combed his hair with Brillo cream. Okay. Still did that. He came to our church at a very bad time. And, and the church had really, it was close to a split. And he came. And this guy who was not with it in the times... He came and he brought healing to our church and strength to this hurt church. And he took this loud mouth high schooler and said, why don't you step up and be the man of God? God is calling you to be. And I said, I, I mean, the high schooler said. <laughs> and he really kept pushing me to accept the call of ministry in my life. These men and others have lifted me higher. They've, they've helped make me better than I could have been myself. By listening to them teach and preach and by watching how they lived the Christian life, I've been called, pulled, pushed higher in faith. If these men have helped me, how many of you could name people in your lives who have helped you with your faith? Right? We, we all better could. And if these people could help us, how much more can Jesus? You know, these people are tangible in our lives. But how much more can Jesus step down and pour out his power? Hebrews 12 says, therefore, what's that for? for? We got to find out. Because of all this stuff, we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Guess what? You're not alone. In your faith. You are not alone. You are not facing this alone. Let us strip off the weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Guess what you and I don't, we probably don't ever have to do, is go to the cross. But he did, so we should keep our eyes on him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. You ever been so burdened by this life, the problems that you're like, ugh, and you just feel like giving up in the faith? You just, why go to church? Why do, look at all this, good things are happening to bad people. Why? Why? And during those times, it's usually we take our eyes off Jesus. We start looking at ourselves and we start seeing the storms around us and we start sinking into that sin. But yet when we take our eyes, put them back on Jesus and we say, man, look at all he endured because of his love for me. Look at all he did because of his faith and obedience in God. And he said, I am doing this for you. Maybe I can stick it out another day because of his grace and power. Maybe because of him, 
I can die to sin. But not only can I die to sin, we can also say no to sin because we live with Him. We are not alone in this world. You do not become a Christian and then Jesus says, okay, good luck. He comes, he invades into your life and he gives you the power, he gives you the wisdom, he gives you the patience to deal with everybody else. He has saved us, he taught us, he gives us his life and his teachings. He's come to live in and through us with his spirit. Because we live with Christ every day, we can say no to sin. And by saying no to sin, we actually proclaim even more how much we believe in Him. But Paul goes on in verse 12. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to your sinful desires. That right there. Well, how many? Oh, it's just how I was born. I, I know a guy in... He, he's Irish. He's got a temper, so it's okay. He's got red hair. He was born this way. Well, his desire is to be angry. But God's word says, don't let anger consume you. And this guy does. And he justifies it. Well, that's, I was just born that way. Well, I have the tendency to eat this too much. I have the tendency to feel this way. I have the tendency to act this way. Do not let sin control the way you live because you died to it and you live with Christ. Do not give in to those sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. You may not know this, but I play... I forgot. You may not know this, but I played trombone in high school. Don't like to toot my own horn, but I was pretty good. That was funny. But um, that's right. One of the things I learned is you could take the slide off, turn the bell around, and I could turn it into a horn. Just, boop, 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 and, and it was really loud. And then if I took the slide part off, I could make it a spitball machine. Re really, that, that's what trombone players think of. And any time I did those things, I used the instrument wrong, and it didn't produce the sound that it was designed to do. And, and one time I thought it'd be funny during a song while we were practicing, not in the concert, but I was practicing. You know this, don't you, Brock? Yeah, he's like, yeah. And I tooted it the wrong way, and instantly Mr. Hickman, Donnie, I mean, he cut everything off, and yeah. That's not how it was designed. Use it the right way. Yes, sir. Just my one little stupidity ruined the song. And when we start living our lives going back to sin, we become an instrument of evil designed the wrong way. We're playing it the wrong way. And we bring disharmony. We ruin the sound of God's grace. And sometimes he's going to say, hey, everybody look, that's how you don't do it. Let's get it back the right way. Because we no longer live that way. See what Paul is saying? Sin is not your master. Sin no longer controls you. Even though you may choose sin from time to time like Adam did, you are not bound to live under that curse forever. Instead, we can say no to sin because we are truly freed from it. We don't have to be bound by it. A man filling out a job application um, came to a question, have you ever been arrested? No. Really? Why not? Because I was never caught. <laughs> I I've heard so many people say, well, it's not wrong unless you get caught. <laughs> That's a lie. It's still wrong. You just didn't get the consequences yet. We've all been caught, though, in our sin. Even if man didn't see us, God did. Even if we don't feel the consequences of the world, Satan still is boasting. God 
asked you to follow him. And when you died to sin, when you live with him, when you are freed from it, God pours into you his spirit because he desires you to be whole, holy and pure. He wants you to be a better people than we are without him. He wants us to be like him who is completely holy. Look what it says in first Peter. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Kids, did you hear that? Self-control. Adults, did you hear that? Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Oh my God, I'd love to stop right there. Parents, don't you want your kids to be obedient children so you can be out there in the world and say, that's my kid. Look how good they are. Look how awesome they are. Instead of going, I don't know who that is. I don't, I don't know. That's what God wants. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living. Don't go back to that grave where that dead, where that corpse of sin is. To satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do. Just as God who chose you is holy. For scriptures say you, me and you, must be holy because I, meaning God, is holy. You and I are to be holy and that is a choice. That means we give up our own evil desires that should be buried and we say whatever you want God. Be holy in all you do. It sounds something of a tall order for us. I, I know for me. I can't do it. I am not holy in all I do or say, but I'd like to be. I'd like to be without fault from sin. In order to get there, I must be set free from the power of that sin so that I can live as God wants me to. And in order to do that, I have to give up the sin nature. I've got to bury it. I've got to be freed. I have to live for him. And then I have to give him control. How many of you ever heard of Bernie Madoff? Yeah, the adults should know who this guy is. 75-year-old Bernie Madoff was sentenced to prison for 150 years because of his Ponzi um, crime scheme when he ripped off, stole billions of dollars, around 65 billions, from investors. Bernie will never be liberated from his prison in Butner, New, um, North Carolina, but his prison cell started long before he was incarcerated. He became enslaved to his own greed. From his prison cell, he was interviewed and called his investors greedy. Well, it's their fault. They're the greedy ones, he said. But his own heart was full of deceit, lying, and greed. And he will never be liberated from it on his own unless he dies to it, gives it to Christ, and he is raised to a new life. And you and I are no different. We have bought into the Ponzi scheme of Satan, of greed. Get all you can in this life. We are all enslaved to sin, various types of sin, unless someone outside of ourselves can come aside and liberate us. We need someone to come and free us from the imprisonment of our sin. And who can do it? 2 Corinthians 5.21 For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Uh, that's 2 Corinthians. We're in Romans. Okay, so let's go to Romans. Thank God once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teachings we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you become slaves to righteous living. We are set free. Casey and I have been watching documentaries on Netflix, and there's some great ones. We saw some of uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, and then we saw one finished last night of the Statue of Liberty. And the whole idea of people who live in America, one guy said, is they take it for granted because they've always lived here. They've just enjoyed the freedoms, the liberties of it, and they take it for granted. And it's somebody who comes who lives in a different part, who is enslaved, who is 
ruled over and they come and they see that statue and they know what it means and they are liberated and they feel that freedom. You and I have no excuse because when we were living under sin, all of us, we came to the symbol that liberated us from that. And unfortunately, many times, the longer we live in Christianity, the longer we start taking it for granted. Do you know that once you become a Christian for 10 or more years, you are 90% likely to never invite someone else to Christ? Why? That, that, that just shocks me. And yet the people who are brand new Christians within the first year or two can't stop. And that's because they keep looking at this and they look at where they used to be. And they said, I could have been buried. I could have been dead. But instead I'm alive. Won't you come too? And while a lot of good church people are like, if only they'd come to church. It's a shame. We need to get out and start living that life of freedom and sharing that. We need to come back and recognize the truth that we are set free. At a church where D.L. Moody was invited to preach, he was warned that some of the congregation usually got up and left before the sermon was over. This minister had a habit of preaching a little long. You guys don't know what that's like. <laughs> But um, yeah. So when Mr. R R uh, Moody rose to begin his sermon, he announced, "I'm going to speak to two different classes of people in this sermon. First, I will speak to the sinners. Then you are dismissed, and then I will speak only to the saints in faith." For the first time in years, everybody sat through the entire service because they all claimed to be the saints. But notice it was their choice. They had to choose. Will they live? Will they sit through so they can be hearing the message of the saint? Or are they going to declare, yeah, I'm a sinner and they're out of there. So what shall it be for you? Will you be a saint or sinner? We should know the answer to this, que this question. We are saints not because of what we can do, but because of the faith of God. We, we are not saints because of anything in our minds or our lives, but because of His life poured in us. We are saints in the eyes of God because we are clothed with Christ. We are sinners in our flesh. We still sin even though our sins have been bought for. Even though we still struggle with sin, we need to learn to live like saints. I, I want you to know I am no better than anyone here. In fact, I could name people who are sitting down right now who have a lot stronger and better faith than I have ever had. And not all of them are older than me. We all need to give up that past and live. That can only happen if we live in Christ, abide in Him, only if we walk with Him daily in prayer and the study of His Word. I can't walk down there. So we're going to come to a time of invitation. And if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never come up and said, you know what, I'm done, i got to give it to Him, will you do that today? We're going to have a time where people are going to come up and sing, and if you need to make that decision to let go of the past and to start living in freedom, will you come?